So without further ado, please show some love to Mike Margulies and Michael Pollan. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. That was great. All right. If, if you haven't seen The Mushroom Cure, you're missing out. Yeah, it's, definitely. It's a wonderful show. It's really awesome. And uh, Adam's, uh, you saw how awesome he is. I definitely recommend it. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you, everyone who's tuning in live. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you have already read the book? Okay, we got a, like a, a handful, maybe 10% is good. Potential converts, tons of them. <laughs> Um, yeah, and if you're watching live, we have a hashtag. It's hashtag Palm Live, where you can uh, engage with this conversation. Uh, I'm really excited, actually, to be here uh, with you today. Uh, this book, I think, does a really good job of taking us on your own journey. It's about how to change your mind. It's, I think it's a statement on yourself and how you changed your own mind. Because in the beginning of the book, you start off actually pretty skeptical and very material-minded. Yeah. And as you go through it, you sort of uh, talk with the researchers, have your own first-hand experiences, and by the end of the book, you kind of close with a, a, a changed mind. Yeah, no, the, the journey that this book records is a very, uh, it's a public journey in that it's a work of science journalism and history, um, but it's also a personal journey. Uh, I, I um, you know, I began with the, the typical journalistic curiosity, and I was interviewing people who were participating in these trials uh, at NYU and at Johns Hopkins. We met in Baltimore when I was That's doing right. reporting. Yeah, That's when we first met. And I was talking to people, uh, many of whom who were psychedelically naive, uh, who had had these powerful uh, transformative experiences. Uh, there were people who were dying. Uh, there were cancer patients in some cases. There were smokers. Uh, and they were so-called healthy normals, and all of them, uh, well not all of them, but about 80% of them had had this um, very powerful experience that left them changed. And as I talked to them, I became intensely curious about how a molecule could account for such a psychological shift, you know, a complete change in perspective. Um, and, uh, but over time, I, I actually grew to envy the people I was, I was interviewing, that they had had um, these big spiritual epiphanies, and I've never had one. Uh, I had never had one. I was kind of, I always thought of myself as kind of spiritually retarded. And, um, and so I got, I got really jealous of them, and, and that's when I decided that to write about this properly, I would have to educate myself uh, and uh, have a series of uh, psychedelic journeys. Um, and that those, yeah, they proved to be transformative. Yeah, and I actually want to really zero in on that, what you said, uh, that the fact that you've had your own experiences, I think is really crucial for this process. There's one thing to, the data's great, but you know, how can we talk about the psychedelic experience without the psychedelic experience? And the fact that you've, written a book that is getting such publicity, where you speak very candidly and very vulnerably about your own experiences, uh, that gives a lot of space for other people to then come out of the psychedelic closet. And I think that's... And that, and that is sort of, that's been one of the interesting phenomena. I mean, there's the book, and then there's the reaction to the book, mm -hmm. which has actually taught me and other people in the community quite a bit about where the culture is. And it's been fascinating to watch. But the number of times I've sat with a journalist doing the conventional interview about your new book, where they've turned off the tape recorder and said, can I tell you a story? Right. <laughs> right. And they have some really big experience that they haven't talked to anybody about in like 30 years. And it was something that actually still, uh, they're still processing. And my writing, my, as someone who apparently has a reputation as an affable, sane person, um, that I was writing about this gave them license to talk about it. And I've been through this over and over and over again with journalists and with people who come to my events. Um, last night I was in uh, Santa Cruz and this woman came up to me with like very large eyes and said, I know exactly what you meant. I described this ego-dissolving experience I had had and she said, 
I melted into the creek alongside Route 17. <laughs> and these goats came up and they were sipping me. <laughs> and, and now, every, and this is 30 years ago, but every time I see a goat, <laughs> her ego dissolves. So yeah. I don't know what to do with this, but... Um, <laughs> If you figure it out, let me know. Yeah, um, but, but, but I do think that phenomenon of coming out of the closet is really yep. important yep. and um, because that's how you normalize things. We've been through that yep. with you know, gay rights yes. and, and so many other things that the willingness to have a matter-of-fact discussion about something that is considered stigmatized or mm. taboo is how you begin to remove that stigma and taboo. Yes. And um, so... I've been kind of gratified that to the extent that I've been willing to speak in a matter-of-fact way on national television or to, to, to any audience about this and that people have responded in kind makes me think that there is a shift underway. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I, that really resonates with me because this is the same reason I got motivated to join this community. Actually, I don't know if you know this, but we entered the psychedelic community, at least publicly, at nearly an identical time. This group, I didn't Psych know that. Psychedelic Seminars, was started in February 2015, which of course is the when, date... When I published my New Yorker piece, yeah. Yep, that was the first piece of content ever shared on this Facebook page. And, um, and I came into this with a very similar motivation as it was sort of like, I want to live in a world where I had transformative experiences and mm -hmm. I want to not feel shame, to speak openly mm -hmm. and honestly about my own experiences. And so, you know, you have to be the change you want to see. So I had to do that and create that space for others. And, and lo and behold, many organizations uh, at the same time, actually very synchronously, other, other people started similar psychedelic societies in cities all around the world. Yeah, I've been amazed at the, uh, at the uh, just this flowering or mushrooming, uh, be, be more appropriate, <laughs> of, uh, of psychedelic societies. What are there, more than 100 now? Yeah, there's something like 100 of them yeah. around the world. And if you can go to psychedelic.community, uh, you can find them if you search under organizations under psychedelic societies. It's, it's really tremendous. I think there is a shift happening, uh, in part because of the research that you document in the book, also in part because of the book itself. You've obviously put a, a much more mainstream lens on uh, the psychedelic movement. And uh, so one thing I'm really interested to talk with you about here is with this increased awareness of the potential for psychedelics, um, where can we go wrong with this movement? And I don't mean another crackdown. I mean, if things stay right on course, mm -hmm. what are the potential pitfalls that we might encounter? And well, before we go there, we should just, I think we should talk about what the potential is, because I don't yeah. know that everybody in the audience Please realizes. Do. Um, and and the center, at the center of this book is a story about a scientific renaissance. Um, and the fact is that, much to my surprise, long before Timothy Leary came along in the 60s, uh, which is, which the 60s has kind of branded psychedelics for most of the culture and for and perhaps many people in the room. Um, but, but long before Timothy Leary had his first transformative experience by a pool in Cuernavaca on psilocybin in 1960, there had been a decade of really uh, fertile research uh, trying to figure out what these amazing molecules were and could do, and then trying to understand how they might be applied therapeutically. And so they went through a whole you know, set of changing paradigms, um, and they gradually kind of coalesced around the idea that these drugs w could be very useful in treating addiction. There was a lot of work on alcoholism in the 50s, and uh, in treating depression and anxiety, and um, uh, and there was, you know, I don't think people realize, but there were a thousand peer-reviewed papers about uh, LSD and psilocybin before 1965, and there were something like 40,000 research subjects, six international co conferences on LSD. It was considered a psychiatric wonder drug um, for, uh, for um, among many people in the psychiatric establishment. And this research um, died, af basically, it faded out after the counterculture embraced psychedelics and there was, a, there was a moral panic around them and lots of horror stories, many of which you know, we've all heard and, and I believed, frankly, most of them when I started this work. Um, and then the research resumed um, and this happened, I mean, I'm making it sound way too simple. It took a lot of work to get it off the ground, to get the FDA and the DEA and to approve it. there are people here that were involved in that. And actually. there are people in this room who, who helped push it forward um, against tremendous odds. 
But beginning in the late 90s, you once again had this resumption of serious, and I'm talking about rigorous uh, controlled trials of psilocybin especially, because LSD was still, you know, for two reasons. LSD was much more controversial, much more likely to run into a political buzzsaw than psilocybin, which most politicians have never heard of. Um, and, and also that, frankly, LSD takes too long. You know, you'd have to have pay overtime to all your therapists um, <laughs> if they're guiding an LSD trip, whereas psilocybin kind of fits into the workday pretty well. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so there have been a series of trials, and they've been very, you know, there's a lot of really good data. It's still preliminary, and there are many more steps. There's more phase two trials. There are phase three trials that have to happen before the FDA will approve it. But that's the path we're on. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, that path was marked by MAPS, the organization, and Rick Doblin, who, who made a study of the... <laughs> who made a study, uh, he went to Harvard to get a PhD in, in uh, government or administration, uh, so, he un so he could really understand what you had to do to get a drug through the FDA. And he charted the path that both psilocybin and MDMA are on right now. <laughs> We're getting psychedelic here. <laughs> yeah. Um, the best laugh of the night is the mics. <laughs> I know. Um, so, yeah, I think. You know, Rick is a great example, actually, of someone who, uh, of the impact an individual can have, really, in really pushing something forward. Also, Bob Jesse, who's in the audience here tonight. Um, yeah, Bob is, um, Bob is less well-known than yes. than uh, Maybe Rick not anymore, because he's the main character. Gives many fewer interviews than Rick. <laughs> spends much more time off the record than Rick. Um, but he has been a key mover. Uh, yeah. And when the history is written, in fact, the history was written uh, in my book, <laughs> Uh, he will. He he is a, a very important player. Yes. Uh, who who's never sought any uh, recognition for his work. Who has really helped drive forward, especially the work on psilocybin and the work being done at uh, at Johns Hopkins in particular. Yeah, and I'm I'm actually very glad that um, he is someone who's showcased in chapter one. He I know Bob was probably shy about it, but if there's, I've told him if there's anybody I'm happy that they have a more of a platform now, it's it's Bob. Uh, so I, I definitely have a lot of respect for the work he's done. Um, and you kind of compared Bob and Rick as kind of like very yeah. different personality types. Opposites, yeah. Um, but both very important in moving this forward. And so now we're on this path for FDA approval. So, so you wanted to know what could go wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and specifically, I would love for you to draw on your prior experience writing about food. Yeah. And we have... Uh, well, we worked that out. That's why I moved on to <laughs> Yeah, <psychedelics>. right. <laughs> we, we worked that out. Um, <laughs> So, you know, in the, as you've documented in a lot of your prior work, there are a lot of issues in the food industry. And so if we think about the prospect of mainstreaming psychedelics and a psychedelic industry emerging, emerging for profit psychedelic businesses, uh, what are the potential pitfalls? And, I, and I'd like to, in particular, give some examples here. So we're in a path where psilocybin can be mm -hmm. FDA approved. Uh, here's the asterisk. It's got to be synthetic psilocybin, not from a mushroom. It's got to be GMP grade. It's got to be given to you by a doctor. It's got to be given to you indoors in a clinic. So we might have access to psychedelics, but you can't grow your own mushrooms. You can't forage your own mushrooms. People like Paul Corbett, we ran an article about him in Symposia. He was arrested for picking wild mushrooms. That'll still happen. Uh, you won't be able to even trip outdoors. Um, this, to me, is kind of like, well, you can buy potatoes and eggs from Monsanto, but you can't own a chicken or a garden. But you can. People do own chickens, and they do own right. gardens. And, and you know, the, so the monopoly is not a very perfect monopoly. And I don't think uh, personal and private use of mushrooms will go away because there is FDA-approved use of it. Mm. Um, and I think it's important to realize, I mean, so I'm not as terrified of that scenario as you are. Um, I think that, um, <laughs> I think it's really important that you have 
the, that, that medical path, even if it is a pharmaceutical path. Yes, agreed. Because that will make the, th let's, uh, and, and we're all, this is all assuming that the therapy proves out in phase three trials and gets approved by the FDA. So we're, 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 we're kind of assuming that. It's a big assumption. Um, but that um, if it is approved in a medical setting and doctors can prescribe it, the upside is uh, there'll be wide access. Anybody with health insurance uh, will be able to be covered by it. So it becomes a little less elite and mm. a little more accessible. And that's a real positive. Um, what does the pharmaceutical industry do with psilocybin? I think it's a kind of a reach for them. Um, you know, the problems with uh, Merck or some big company getting into psychedelics are many. One is, Where's your intellectual property? I mean, these mushrooms grow anywhere, and um, the, the, even the well, molecule. You can, patent, mo you can patent biology now, right? <laughs> well, you can, but, the, but not this molecule. You can right. patent a delivery system, a manufacturing method, but the fact is it's, it's hard to get your hands around mm. uh, and, and have that kind of control. Uh, same with LSD. That's off patent also. Um, and so that may be one of the reasons that big pharma doesn't so far appear to have any interest. Here's the other big problem. Psychedelic therapy is a one-time or a two-time or maybe a three-time thing. Um, it's not a pill you take every day. And they're in the business of selling pills people have to take every day, like SSRIs, antidepressants. Mm. So how do you make money if you're selling two or three pills right. to somebody over the course of a lifetime? Sell microdoses. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just, microdosing, I just gave an idea to <laughs> microdosing is probably a better idea for the pharmaceutical industry. The problem with microdosing is no one has any idea if it's real or not. There's, there's no science on microdosing. It's, there's science coming now, actually. The, Beckley, it, some is going to be yeah. done. Beckley has proposed to do it. I don't know if that's going to get off the ground, but there's a couple other mm. things going on around the world, yeah. and maybe in a year or two we'll have, you know, one of the reasons I didn't go into great detail on microdosing is that uh, there's no good science about it yet. Um, mm. it, it could be all placebo effect, and there's nothing wrong with that, and I hope the research doesn't louse up your placebo effect. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yes, there is a yeah. pill you take several times a week. You know, you can sell that. In, I can see it in little packs like birth control pills, you know. <laughs> with every yeah. third, you know, there's, there's a couple sugar pills, and then you get your microdose pill. <laughs> um, and, um, uh, but um, so will the pharmaceutical industry jump in? Mm -hmm. The other problem with it is it's not really simply a drug. It's, it's, it, and we call it psychedelic therapy, but we really should call it psychedelic assisted yeah. psychotherapy. And that's usually what MAPS uh, is calling it now. Yeah, yeah, they do, although in some of the studies, it's interesting to watch how the researchers play this. When they're doing right. the studies that, go, you know, that are part of the drug trials, they try to, they try to play down the role of the guide. And frankly, the role of the psychedelic guide is central. Yeah, I mean, these drugs are so powerfully affected by set and setting that um, it is only in the company of somebody you really trust, who knows yeah. the territory, that someone can have the, you know, surrender to the experience in a way that it can make it productive. Yeah. And um, so, so really it's a package that's being tested. And that's, that's weird for the, the industry or even the medical system. Mm. You know, normally we have talk therapy over here and we have, you know, uh, psychoactive drug therapy over here. But now we're going to have to combine them in this very novel uh, package, which is exciting. And, yeah. you know, we never should have separated the mind and the brain, right? I mean, this brings them back <laughs> together. Um, but that, too, is like, how do even the psychiatrists work that out? You know, you, it's, it's all day with two therapists or at least two people in the room. Um, so all that is going to have to be figured out, and, yeah. and I think these are real challenges. So, you know, before the Mercs of the world or the Johnson & Johnsons get involved, I think there's going to be probably much more activity in the nonprofit sector. Yeah. Uh, and so far, you know, it's been nonprofit money that has uh, charitable contributions that has funded most of the work. It's amazing to have a drug going through this process without a big corporation behind it, uh, but that's yes. what we're seeing. Yeah. And a lot of contributions from people in this city in particular. Yes. There are uh, probably a lot of MAPS donors in this room as well. MAPS um, donors and other people who are supporting, uh, there's something called the Psychedelic Science um, Funding Collaborative, uh, which is a relatively new uh, organization that is um, 
collecting donations and, and has had great success. And enough money has been raised to actually get through the whole mm. drug trial process. That, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, but, in, but going back to your question mm. about, um, uh, about the problems ahead, you have to, you know, one of the questions that Bob Jesse sensitized me to is what about people who are not mentally ill who stand to benefit betterment of from well these people, drugs? As he puts it. This beautiful phrase, the betterment of well people. Um, how can we serve those people? What, and it, does that argue for yes. outright legalization or decriminalization mm. or, um, uh, or what? Yeah, um, and, and I think this kind of gets back to maybe the core of what I was getting. You mentioned access. And I guess uh, to clarify my earlier statements, don't get me wrong, I support the FDA research by all means. I want to see those FDA approved containers uh, for medical therapeutic use of psychedelics to exist. My concern is if they become the exclusive containers yeah. and a new priest class that controls access to psychedelics. And as you know, thinking about access, right, our medical system as it is, is pretty broken. And yeah. there isn't equal access to medicine. And the war on drugs itself is a war on medicine in many ways, as we're seeing with how you know, the Schedule One drugs arguably are, you know, that have no medical use are arguably the things with the most medical use. Yeah, and um, the least potential for abuse. Yeah, and the least yeah. potential for abuse. This is the, the big irony of our situation. Um, and in many ways, I mean, let's look at cannabis as an example. I see a lot of issues with cannabis in particular uh, with respect to questions like access, even in places where there's legalization, you know, because you can go and buy cannabis from the legalized distributor, but I can't even buy weed from my neighbor. I can't have, there's no farmer's markets for weed. And do we, you know, uh, is this the best model that we can come up with? And I guess I'm putting, I don't know the answer to this question, but I'm putting it out there, like, are there better models and, uh, where we don't, where we create safe access to containers to have an yeah. experience with, the, with a, it is important to have an experienced facilitator, but can we do that without criminalizing other methods, without mm -hmm. putting people into prisons for picking mushrooms, yeah. uh, et cetera? And I don't know the answer to this. But yeah, I don't either. I mean, I, I do think that it should be decriminalized. I don't, I don't think that that's a, uh, I think, picking your own mushrooms. Um, but I also think that the cannabis model, which is kind of like, you know, that we see in California, might not be right here. Um, mm. Just because, I, I mean, my own experience and interviewing dozens of people who've had, uh, who've been through uh, psychedelic therapy, is that these drugs are uniquely powerful and that the role of the guide is very important um, to, a, uh, to a successful experience. It's not to say people haven't had terrific experiences, you know, taking mushrooms or LSD and, you know, going to, I just talked to someone who went to a festival last weekend and had a fantastic experience. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, you know, that's all true. Um, but there is another kind of experience people have too. And, um, you know, given a poor set and setting, uh, and set as your, in, you know, your internal environment and your external environment uh, setting, um, people have, you know, experiences that really rock them psychologically and, and leave people in a really bad place. And so how do you mitigate that risk? Um, and I do think that the, the idea of a guide, a trained guide, is a very important way. Absolutely. You know, the, the big lesson, part of the issue with psychedelics in our society is they, they kind of burst upon our culture in the 50s and 60s without any preparation. Suddenly these incredibly powerful, interesting molecules show up. Psilocybin is discovered in Mexico by the first Westerner, Gordon Wasson, in 1955. He writes a big article in Life magazine, and suddenly people want it and descend on this town in Mexico. And then uh, LSD is, is discovered or really tried out in the 40s and, and becomes this drug of research. And, but we got the molecule without the package. We got the molecule without the traditions, mm -hmm. the rituals, the ceremonies. The rites of passage. The ri yeah, the rites of passage. So if you look back, the history of psychedelics, which is so much older than the, than the 50s and 60s in America and Europe, you see that, that many cultures use these drugs, these medicines, in a very carefully designed context. You never see people using them alone. And this is whether we're talking about ancient Greece, Siberia, uh, you know, s the Amazon, uh, Central America. They never use the drugs alone. 
it was always with elders or shamans or curanderas presiding, and there was always ceremony and yep. ritual. And there's a reason for that. Yep. Um, it's not just superstition. It's the fact that um, there was enormous respect for the power of these, these medicines and that they shouldn't be used carelessly. Uh, you know, it was a capital crime in Greece. The Greeks had a, what, a, what we think is a psychedelic ceremony once a year, uh, the Eleusian Mysteries, uh, and there was a, a, a potion they took that appears to have been a psychedelic. It allowed people to travel to the underworld and meet the dead and, and, and enter other realms. Um, you could only use this medicine in that ceremony. And it was a, it was a capital crime. You could be, you could be mm -hmm. executed for using it recreationally. Um, and, uh, and I use that word advisedly. Um, but um, so there, there was a reason for all that. And, and the kind of individualistic um, use that, you know, we've pioneered in the West, you know, may not be the best. Yeah. So I think we have to be open to that and, and be willing to learn from history. Absolutely. And I, I've been that guy who took psychedelics in the wrong context. I was the guy paranoid at Burning Man, you know, <laughs> <laughs> too paranoid to even go to the Zendo Project. Uh, so. Uh, and whereas I, when I did psychedelics, I actually was a participant at Johns Hopkins. And in that setting with Mary Casamano, uh, who's probably facilitated more, more... More trips than anybody in at the, least above in board, the modern... Yeah. yeah, above ground, in the and, modern period of research, yeah. And, and this really the reflects... The key figure. Yes, uh, which reflects uh, what you were getting at before, the importance of the facilitator in that. And it's... The importance of a facilitator who can take on a passive role, but it's act, it's almost active passive, you know, someone who is not guiding your experience, but they are able to, but they, there is a really active holding of space there. And yeah. presence. And that jargon, you know, is, I mean, it's actually pretty accurate. I mean, it's, it's to my ear, it sounds like uh, a holding space, um, but, <laughs> but there, but I, I came to appreciate it because what's happening in these experiences is a, um, when it's a high dose therapeutic experience, you, you are, um, your ego may well be dissolving and with it your defenses, right? We have these defenses that are, serve us. They get in our way too, but they serve us. And to, to, to feel comfortable putting down all your defenses, you have to feel really safe. Mm. And if you do that in the wrong setting and you fight to hold on to your sense of self and your defenses is when you get paranoid and have a really awful experience. So um, it takes a certain skill. It takes a certain compassion. And Mary Cosimono has it more than probably anybody um, yes. to, to create that space where you, you feel comfortable enough to put down every defense you have built up over the course of your life. It's a huge uh, gesture of trust. And great things can come from it, but it will only come in the right setting. Yeah, and and I think um, you know to get back to the question of uh, yeah the importance of the guides and how do we how do we reconcile this right with say decriminalization and I, I like I may be borrowing this idea from somebody but I think about scuba diving I scuba dive right mm. um, and so you always have a buddy right you always have a buddy right but it's let's say hypothetically I was going to strap on a scuba tank jump in the water without a license right very dangerous thing to do, right? But there wouldn't be like, you wouldn't need police to come and arrest me right. for doing that, right? It's just known in the culture that scuba diving is dangerous. Scuba diving is dangerous. So if you're gonna go scuba diving, you should get a training, you should get a certification. And the people won't take you on a dive if you haven't gotten the safety training. Uh, you don't need to enforce that with prisons, but you enforce it with education. And not enforce it, but you just use education. And I think there's a, a and, and so that which gets me to with psychedelics, what's the best way that we can create an alternative model? Uh, well, let's talk about the risks of psychedelics. Let's make it more culturally known. Like there is obviously tremendous positive potential, which is not to be downplayed whatsoever um, in all these studies. But I think if we have a respect and an awareness for the risks of psychedelics and what can go wrong, that's where we just culturally create. It's like anyone who's thinking about doing it, yeah, of course, you should go see someone who's trained to do this thing. Yeah. And embed that in the culture that the importance of that facilitator. Yeah, I think so. And also there are lots of people who don't want to be underground with, their, with whatever they do and would feel so much more comfortable right. if there were such a thing as a licensed psychedelic guide 
who could prescribe or perhaps worked in an institution that had an MD involved who could do the prescription. Um, and that opens, I mean, talk about access, that opens it up to lots of people who aren't comfortable buying drugs underground and, 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 and not being sure that of the strength of what they're getting. Um, so I, I can definitely see a situation where we have such people. Um, and in fact, CIIS in this city, yes. uh, the California Institute for Integral Studies, is, has a training program now to train psychedelic guides, most of whom will work in these uh, trials, these drug trials that are going to be happening. Um, but it, you know, it's I, w I, I attended this um, uh, one of their several of their sessions, and there are people who see this as a as a profession that they want to um, they want to enter. How amazing! I mean, five years ago, I, you, you can't imagine something like this. Yeah, and and there's <coughs> certainly no shortage of need here. Uh, no, I think there's going to be an explosion of demand, and I think it's. I mean, if you talk about things that can go wrong. Uh, my worry is that so ma as people learn more about the science and as, as more science is done, the demand for um, a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy will be so great that it will overwhelm the number of guides we have with the result that you'll have lots of charlatans appearing, right. hanging out shingles, um, right. saying, I'm a psychedelic guide. Right. And, you know, Bad things can happen, um, you know. I mean, you are. I mean, I talked about how vulnerable you are. Imagine the opportunities for, you know, sexual abuse. And this is actually happening today. People go to Peru for ayahuasca, and, they and bad like, things happen. Yeah. Yes, this um, is a major issue in the community right now, actually. Yeah, yeah. So there, it's it's not going to be simple. Um, you know, this is, but this is cultural innovation. I mean, this yeah. is, you know, we'll learn in the same way those those traditional cultures gradually learn the to create the proper container for the psychedelic experience, our culture needs to do that work too. Yeah. And it may not be simply the medical container, right? right? You know, the white, what I call white coat shamanism. I and mean, we have our <laughs> own shamans, they're called doctors, and, um, and that makes some people very comfortable. Um, but that, it seems to me, would be a little too limited. Yeah, I agree. Um, can I ask you some tough questions? Yeah, sure. All right. Oh, these have been so easy. <laughs> Um, I want to address, because uh, a lot of people in the audience today are actually from the psychedelic community, and so uh, and people have been working uh, in this community for some time, and so there's been criticisms come, that have come back towards you, uh, and I'd like to just give you the opportunity to address sure. directly, right? So the first of which being like, okay, so why, are we, why do we care about what Michael Pollan has to say about this, is outsider, so to speak, from this, uh, from this psychedelic space? There's the things in the book have been talked about before, why is everyone so... Uh, excited now, and, and why should we listen to, to your angle on this whole thing? Well, nobody has to. Uh, everybody's, <laughs> nobody, was anyone coerced to come <laughs> here today or to buy my book? Um, you know, I am an outsider. Um, this book is written from the perspective of someone who was fairly psychedelically naive, who got interested and, and entered this community. There is a perspective, though, that the newcomer has that no one else ever has again. I mean, I learned this a long time ago as a writer. Um, one of the most influential books I read uh, when I was 13 was a book called Paper Lion uh, by George Plimpton. Anybody know who that is? Yeah, okay. So he was, a, uh, he was also the editor of the Paris Review, and he reinvented sports writing by, instead of just being on the sideline chomping on a cigar, he decided he was going to train with the Detroit Lions, and he persuaded them to do it, and actually play quarterback in a scrimmage game uh, in, during spring tra or summer training. And that gave him a perspective that not only the sideline sports writers had never had, but the players had never had because they took it for granted. They'd been playing football their whole life. They were used to getting their heads bashed in. You know, it was, that was normal. Um, I don't mean to liken any of you to, um, to you know, football players getting their heads bashed in, but, but the fact is there's something about first sight, yes. first experience, that opens up something that you never recapture again. So I think the, my, my newness to the experience contributes something. Yes. Um, and, it, and it certainly allowed me to write about it yes. in a way that is hard to do if you have a lot of experience. Um, and then there is the fact that I come, you know, that most books about psychedelics, and I don't say this to criticize them, have been written from within the community. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, to people outside the community, those books like might be written in another language. 
Yes. They're like, they're Greek to a lot of people. Um, and that, so my, my reluctance, the fact that I had so many, um, so much resistance I had to overcome. I mean, fear of the drugs, distaste for the music, <laughs> um, 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 reluctance about the new age lingo. I mean, there were so many things I had to get over um, that I think that creates a perspective that, that or becomes a door mm. for people in the mainstream to take a look at this yes. world. Um, so to me, I think that's the value added of having, you know, someone who's not an expert. Yeah. And also as a writer, I don't like writing as an expert. One of the reasons I left food is I'd become an expert. And it's much less, it's much more fun to write at the beginning of the learning curve. Um, and let your readers learn with you. Yes. Um, and bring them on the journey instead of completing the journey and then standing up and lecturing them. And that's a, that's a whole other way to write, and it's not what I do. I, I, I totally agree with that, and I want to add to that as well. You spent, what, four years researching this book? Yeah. So talking to like researchers that. around the world, taking psychedelics yourself, that's nothing to you know, scoff at here. You spent four years researching this yeah. community. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And it's, uh, yeah, and I still don't think I'm an expert. I mean, I still have a lot to learn. Um, but also, you know, even those people in the community, some of them, some of them know about the history, some of them don't. Some of them know about the neuroscience, some of them don't. Um, so I think that even for people in the community, uh, there's uh, material that may be unfamiliar. Yeah, well, so, so you don't have the depth of these experts, but a breadth of knowledge. Yeah. I think there's value in that. Yeah, and I'm a generalist, I'm a generalist. Yeah. And I also bring the perspective of um, uh, someone who's worked on plants for a very long yes. time and has been interested in nature. And I put this in the context, I mean, it, peop people who wonder how I got from food to psychedelics, well, they're both about nature. They're, yeah. they're things we take into our body that change us. We change them in the, in the process. And it's part of our engagement with the natural world, which is fundamentally my topic as a writer. Food is, is one branch on that tree, psychedelics, and, and psychoactive drugs in particular are another. Yeah, and another thing I had a character who recurs in your book is Huxley. Yeah. And he was called on. He's a writer. He was called on to like put language to things. Right. And I think in many ways you're operating as our kind of modern Huxley here. Yeah. Um, putting language to things. Like I, I, in particular, one piece of language I really appreciated was you talk about the need for additional first person pronouns. Yeah. You know? <laughs> what do you, who well, the there is a strange thing that happens to your first person pronoun, and you realize the limitations of our language when, you know, I, I say at some point, and I and I beheld my my ego turning into a sheaf of little post-its, and like, what? Wait, who beheld that? <laughs> How right. can you behold yourself? And uh, there is this separation of of um, of your yourself into these parts that can happen that really strains our language because mm -hmm. our language is not written to describe psychedelic experience. Right. And yeah, so that's the other, you know, that's the toolkit I bring. I'm a writer, yeah. and when you tell me something's ineffable, that's when I want to eff it. You know? <laughs> uh, that's when I get really interested. Um, and uh, so, so, and you know, look, writing about trips is really difficult. Just go on yes, Arrowhead, and you'll see how difficult it is. It is. Um, and so, you know, having been a writer for you know, 35 years. Um, it was really an interesting challenge, and I love that challenge. And, um, and I had more fun writing those passages in this book than I've ever had <laughs> writing. Um, I mean, you can judge whether they succeed, but um, it was an interesting literary challenge. And uh, so, anyway. Yeah, um, so my second tough question for yeah. you. It, uh, one of the main criticisms coming from the psychedelic community is people that have observed that many of the characters in the book are people that look like me and you white men mm -hmm. um, are dominating the narrative. So there's questions around uh, voices of women and indigenous perspectives. Um, can you speak to these critics? Yeah, I mean, the psychedelic world is very white and male in America. Yes. Um, and I've noticed that from the beginning. Um, most of the, uh, you know, people you, uh, most of the researchers are white male, most of the scientists, which was my focus, uh, and you look at the history, and most of the big characters in the history um, have been white men. Um, do I perpetuate that by writing about them? I guess I do. Um, 
There are some really important female characters in this book, though, mm -hmm. um, and some of them people of color. Maria Sabina, for example, the, the woman who turned on Gordon Wasson and uh, really led to, brought psilocybin to the West inadvertently. Um, and that was, you know, that's not a happy story for her. Right. Um, in the end, that, um, that, you know, led to the, essentially the destruction of her little village in Oaxaca as uh, celebrities descended and um, uh, her house was burned down by her, by people in the village, they were so mad at her. Uh, she regretted having done it. Um, but anyway, there's a, there's a very important woman of color in this narrative. Um, of the guides I work with, I work with three guides, two of them were women. Um, Mary, one of them, is, is, is really kind of the hero of the book in many ways. Um, are there women that I overlooked? I'm sure there are. Um, and, um, you know, some of that is no doubt a, a result of my perspective, but a lot of it is a result of the history that I was writing about. Mm. You could write an alternative history of psychedelics and you could talk all about Albert Hoffman's assistant and Gordon Wasson's wife and, you know, so there's, is there a feminist history of psychedelics to be written? I hope so, and I, I hope somebody writes it. Um, you know, <laughs> this is not the last book on psychedelics. Um, I, I, I think these other perspectives need to be told. I'm not the best person to tell them, perhaps, mm. but, um, but I hope there are many more books to be written from a variety of perspectives. In terms of indigenous peoples, um, you know, it's funny, someone stood up in Cambridge and, and, and said something that I found really uh, upsetting. She, this was the, the second day of my book tour. This woman stands up from the Boston Entheogen Network. Maybe she's watching. And she says, as the de facto leader of the psychedelic <laughs> community or the psychedelic movement, I was like, really? And, you know, and Rick Doblin was in the room, the real leader. <laughs> And I turned to him and I made him stand up and absorb all this <laughs> weird juju. And, um, and then she went on to say, you know, how do you answer the criticism that there aren't more African Americans in the psychedelic community? Um, actually, she, she said more people of color. And there actually are quite a few people of color if, you, if you're willing to go beyond the borders of America and look at people in South America and Central America and, you know, the shamanic tradition, there, there are tons of people of color involved in ayahuasca, for example. Um, but she, I think she was thinking about African Americans. And it, that's a really interesting question. I, I would get the same question about food. You know, why, aren't, why don't we have more people of color involved in the food movement? Um, and they're legitimate questions. And, and um, but first, I, you know, I'm not a leader. I mean, you just made the point. I'm a newcomer. How can I be a leader? Um, I don't know enough to advocate. Um, I'm, I'm still learning. Um, but people are hungry for leadership, definitely. Yeah. Um, so anyway, there are, you know, my focus though, I think, I wasn't trying to write the comprehensive history of psychedelics in the world. I was really writing, at the center of this book is a renaissance of scientific research, Western scientific research. I'm interested in the shamanic tradition insofar as it influences that. And, um, uh, and so I go off from that spine, but that spine is science, and that science is, is you know, is, is pretty white and pretty male. Mm. So let's, actually, let's talk about the science here, and, and it's specifically as it relates to some of your prior work in food, right? Um, and you talked about things like nutritionism, right? And we got into this weird point with food where, you know, we, we've, we've invented white bread. Yeah. Where we took things out. And then we realized, oh, we took out the healthy things. And then we had nutrient-enriched white bread. Right. And so, as you put it, you, you put the, the problem and the solution in the same package. Same neat package, yeah. Um, and, and, and so the point being that we had this clever science, but maybe at all along nature was had it right to begin yeah. with. So let's make an analogy here to mushrooms. We're doing all this research on psilocybin. Is it possible that if we focus on this one nutrient, yeah. the psilocybin, are we missing something important it's, in the whole it's mushroom? It's completely possible. I don't know the answer for sure. I mean, there are actually two chemicals in psilocybin. There's psilocin and psilocybin. Right. But there may be other compounds, too, and they may be relevant. And, right. they, and also, there may be different compounds. You know, uh, psilocybe cubensis, which is the main mushroom most people use, is only one of 150 different psilocybin species. Uh, does azorescence have other stuff in it? It seems to have some slightly different effects. Um, 
So, and we know this in cannabis, right? You know, we know there are two famous cannabinoids, THC and CBD, but mm -hmm. there are many, many more. Yeah. Um, when people started fooling around with um, uh, beta carotene or, you know, these, they, they, they thought that, you know, the key to the carrot is this, this uh, antioxidant called beta carotene and they, and they turned it into a pill and they gave it to people thinking it would help them and in fact, uh, it hurt them. Uh, the, the death rate from cancer went up in, in people who were eating the supposedly good nutrient. Well, it turns out that there are, you know, 49 other carotenes in a carrot, and, um, uh, and we haven't studied most of them. So we should be very respectful of the, uh, of the mushroom as nature gives it to us, um, and at least explore the possibility that there are other things going on that are valuable. Um, if, you know, there are cases when, you know, we synthesize things successfully and effectively, um, but our tendency is, is, uh, to, is reductive. And, you know, for science, you need to be reductive, right? You need to isolate that chemical to, to perform a drug trial. Um, but I think we should be aware that there may be, you know, same, the difference between peyote and mescaline. I mean, you know, has anyone really explored that? I don't know the answer. But the other parallel from food that I think is really relevant, and I'm glad you brought this up, is um, eating alone. Mm. You know, we Very good um, point. one of the one of the main trends in Western food is the move from eating as a communal act to eating as something you do in the car. You know, 46% of meals are eaten alone now. 20% are eaten in the car. And this kind of atomized individualistic eating turns out not to be very good for your health um, because people eat too much when they eat alone. Whereas when you eat at a table with other people, other things are going on. You're talking, you're conversing, and, and you eat in a more moderate way. And um, so there's something about socializing and experience that can make it healthier. Right. And that may be true with psychedelics too. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing this up actually. Um, and we look in the traditions, a lot of the time psychedelics are taken in groups, ayahuasca circles, yes. communal, uh, or in the case of if we go to Gabon and we talk about iboga, it's actually hit the communal aspect of that is almost reversed. There's one person in the getting initiated, and this may not be true in all Bwiti traditions, it's very uh, diverse in itself, but there's an initiate and then the entire community is around you, supporting mm -hmm. you. And so the community aspect, not to mention integration and all this other aspect. Uh, and, and right now, it, with the FDA approval process, where we're going toward is single person with two guys, which is, seems it's like- It's single it's, person, but not alone. Not alone, right. Yeah, it's like eating with a chaperone at McDonald's. But we don't, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it's not really, but. <laughs> But we really don't have a necessarily right now a line of sight to group psychedelic work, which yeah. I think. Well, you know, I, but I, I think that's coming. I think one of the ways you'll deal with the inefficiencies of two therapists uh, and one person, uh, and I think there's some proposals afoot, in, at least I know in Europe, Bob Jesse will send me a memo about this later um, if I'm wrong, that um, of, of looking at the possibility of doing group psilocybin mm. as a way to make, uh, you know, that two therapists could actually work on six people at once yeah. uh, or eight people. And I think that's worth exploring. I mean, yeah. certainly that's the ayahuasca model, you're right. And I know uh, MAPS has a study for couples therapy, actually, yeah. where one person in, in the couple has PTSD. Um, and, so, and they're actually treating the couple collectively because they're both affected by the PTSD. Sure. And, and this gets into the broader dynamics of socially, you know, we're not just isolated individuals. No. We're part well, that, of that, that's true of the cancer studies too. There are people like uh, Catherine right. McLean who, who makes the argument, and it's a very good argument, yeah. that the caregivers can benefit just as much from psilocybin therapy as the person who's dying. And that it, it, it's a whole constellation that's affected by that, by that event. Um, and the grief, um, and there's actually a, a study of um, AIDS survivors uh, with psilocybin that's about to start yes. in San Francisco, um, and that is treating the survivor, not the um, not the patient. Um, so I think there's you know there's so much to more to be learned, and right. there's so many exciting experiments to do, and what's what's really wonderful is that this space has been created by these pioneers, and the and the you know, the willingness of the FDA to go along with this, because um, they have been basically encouraging of the research in recent years, um, that we're gonna learn a lot. We're gonna learn a lot about the mind 
and about you know, the way it works and the way it sometimes fails to work in the next few years. And that psychedelics, in addition to be in being interesting of themselves, are going to prove to be a very powerful tool for understanding addiction and yeah. dying and um, depression and anxiety and the mind and consciousness. And, um, and that, to me, is really yes. exciting. You know, Stan Groff had that, uh, the, the, the legendary um, psychedelic psychiatrist um, who's still with us. Uh, he said once, and I remember reading this early in my research and thinking, that is ridiculous. He said um, uh, that psychedelics or LSD would be for the study of the mind, what the telescope was for astronomy, and what the microscope was for biology. It was really an audacious thing to say, especially then. Um, but actually, I no longer think that's crazy at all. I mean, I think that yeah. um, psychedelics do have very important things to teach us. Yeah. So I think we're about time for questions um, <coughs> from the audience here. Um, so Al There's a hand going up there. The hand's already going up there. So uh, there's yeah. going to be a microphone right here. Yeah, Let's I think see. Alan okay, might have. There we go. We are live. All right. So we will gladly take questions starting right here, and then we're actually going to form a line over there behind. So the second person in line, go ahead over there. Yeah, it's not a shy group. So yeah. So go ahead. You can be second, but just go over there. So that's where the line will be. <laughs> no, you're good. You were first. Yeah, you're first. You're good. All right, perfect. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. So uh, on behalf of all of us here, like huge thank you for doing what you've done, both of you for hosting the event as well as for uh, taking this big step and getting rid of some of the taboo around psychedelics. Thank you. Yeah, and I, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I want to actually, Alan. yeah, you want to, yeah, I want to add a disclaimer here. We are live streaming, so just bear in mind if you do come ask a question, you will be on the internet. So that is true. Full disclosure. That's true. Full disclosure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, I have a quick question uh, to launch it off. So, as much as the beauty of being able to quell the ego is so important for civilization. Where does that come into play for children? Wh how, do we know, yeah. uh, how do we know at what age and like, is it appropriate? It's, n it's not appropriate for everyone. So what are, you, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I don't know when, when it's advisable for people to start using psychedelics. Uh, and I haven't really explored that. Um, but it's important to understand that the structures that psychedelics melt um, are formed, uh, you know, a little later in life. Um, young children, I, I talk about young children in the book, um, and in fact there's a whole uh, passage about uh, uh, this brilliant child psychologist at uh, Berkeley who really believes that the consciousness of children under five or so is very similar to, the, to psychedelic consciousness. And she basically thinks little kids are tripping all the time. <laughs> and and they, if you've had sure. one, you know that they do. And, um, uh, but they don't have a default mode network. We haven't talked about that, but that's the network in the brain that appears to go quiet or be quieted during the psychedelic experience. That doesn't develop till they go to school and, and begin to develop a sense of uh, themselves as consistent beings over time. That, you know, you're not born feeling that way. Um, and, you know, personality doesn't really kind of gel until your early 20s. Um, so it's a curious time to, to uh, dissolve your personality um, before that. Um, and, you know, for some people it's fine, and for other people it's, I think, very challenging. And one quick follow-up to that, and it's something that I think many people are curious about, where do we strike a balance between nationalism and globalism? It seems to be one of the most pressing things that's going on in the world, is how do we be foster a collective consciousness across the globe, but also how do we ensure that we can thrive as the United States at the same time? Where do you, how do you strike a balance with that as well? Well, you know, I think one of the interesting things about psychedelics is that they potentially address two of the biggest challenges we face as a civilization. One is the environmental crisis, our disconnection from nature, and the other is tribalism, our disconnection from people who are unlike us. Um, one of the amazing things that happens on a successful psychedelic experience is a reconnection with nature. 
you, you no longer objectify the other. One of the things the ego does is patrol these borders between self and other, self and nature, and self and subconscious. And um, when you put those down, when you quiet those voices, is when you can connect to the other in a very profound way. And, and I describe experiences I had with nature where I saw nature in a completely different way. I was a part of it, part and parcel of it, not an observer, not a spectator. Um, and did it with other people. I mean, the, the most common, uh, you know, experience people report is this feeling of this flood of love for other people, whether in their lives or, or people very unlike them. And, um, you know, is there anything we need more right now? The challenge is, though, how do you go from uh, creating those experiences in individuals to creating it across a society? And uh, we, there is no model for administering a drug to an entire society. Mi Microdose the Whole Foods buffet. Well, or, I mean, we do have, <laughs> we do have fluoride. Um, but I think psychedelics are very different than fluoride. So I can potentially give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the default mode network. Can, can you, you talk some about that and, and just, you know, the potential value in dissolving the ego? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, the neuroscience that I learned about was, to me, intellectually, the most exciting part of doing this book. And, um, and, and that really is where we're learning, what, we're, what we're learning about consciousness and the mind. So when, um, when neuroscientists first began imaging the brains of people on psilocybin or LSD, they would actually like inject someone with the medicine and slide them into that fMRI tube. And if you've ever been in an fMRI and you've ever tripped, imagine combining those two things. These volunteers, you know, yeah. deserve a hand. Um, that's I declined not, to be in this study, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that is serious volunteer duty. Um, what they expected to see, though, was, um, and this work was first done in Imperial College, London, by a brilliant neuroscientist named Robin Carhart Harris, who I, I profiled. Another white male, I'm sorry to report, but there it <laughs> is. Um, and, uh, and so they expected to see lots of activity on the fMRI and, you know, consistent with the fireworks that people report. Um, but what they saw instead was a, a reduction in activity in this one particular network that happens to be very important to our sense of self, and that is the default mode network. And this is a set of structures in the midline of the brain that connects structures that are within the uh, cortex, the evolutionarily most recent part of the brain uh, that has our executive function and higher order uh, functions, um, with deeper, older structures involved with memory and uh, emotion. And it's a hub in the brain. Lots of signals pass through it. It's like a Grand Central Station or something. And then it's also a regulator. Uh, as Robin calls it, it's the conductor of the neural symphony. It's, and, and so what does it do? Well, it's involved in self-reflection, as far as we know, and self-criticism and rumination. It's where your mind goes when it's wandering or worrying. It's involved in time travel, the ability to think about the future or the past, which is very important to a sense of identity. Without a sense of time, you don't have a sense of identity. Uh, it's involved in uh, theory of mind, which is the ability to imagine mental states in other people, which is critical to moral reasoning and ethical reasoning. And it's involved in something called the experiential self. Um, this is kind of where we generate the stories that um, connect what happens to us at any given time to this, uh, the story of who we are. Um, so how interesting that when this network goes quiet, or appears to on an fMRI, that's when people report an experience of complete ego dissolution. Um, what good is that? Well, the researchers, you know, are still speculating about it. They do think that ego dissolution, which some refer to as the mystical experience, I, I actually think they're pretty much the same thing. One is a spiritual vocabulary, one is a psychodynamic mm. vocabulary. Um, but similar things happen when you lose a sense of ego. You, you merge with other things because the walls come down. And that permits a reconnection um, with other people, with nature, with your past self. Um, and that uh, when our defenses are down, we can break out of the stories in which we trap ourselves. 
you know, those really destructive stories we tell about ourselves, and, and, and depressed people in particular, and addicts in particular, the story that says you can't get through the day without a drink, the story that says that you, you're unworthy of love. Um, we get stuck in these loops of rumination and recrimination, and the psychedelic experience of ego dissolution gives you um, uh, a new perspective. It's temporary, but you see that, wow, you don't have to think that way. Um, and those stories, they're, they're broken. They're, they're, their power over you is broken, e even if just for some, a period of time, but having had a taste of that other form of consciousness where you're not the victim of your loops of destructive thought can be liberating. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a theoretical hypothesis of how it works, um, but it's a compelling one. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting, this idea of decentralizing the brain, and it's very timely considering this theme, a lot of people here are probably from the blockchain world, uh, you know, this theme of decentralization, and so in many ways psychedelics are like the, you know, decentralizing the brain in the same way that blockchains are decentralizing Yeah, in that sense they're anti-hierarchical, um, the experience, and, and actually, those of you who have the book in your lap, look at page 318. <laughs> Sorry, not everybody has it, but go outside and look at page 318 <laughs> later. Um, and there's a map of the brain uh, on a placebo uh, and, and on um, psilocybin. And, there, uh, and so there's a perimeter in this map, and every circle represents a different brain network. Uh, the brain is organized in these networks. One deals with you know, locomotion, one deals with the visual cortex. And um, there are a few big highways in the first illustration. Yes, I don't know if um, you can see this from oh, here, but you. it's. A very and when the default image. mode network goes down, all these new connections form that have never existed before. The brain is temporarily rewired, and suddenly you have this explosion of new pathways. And we don't know what's happening on those pathways. They could explain synesthesia, right? The phenomenon of, of, um, of uh, tasting a color. Uh, that may be the cross-wiring of two, two brain networks. Or the new insights or metaphors that people report. Those may be a new way to connect dots. Um, that's the exciting work, is to figure out what's going on in that new map and uh, what kind of thinking happens. But the fact is, the brain is being wired in a new way temporarily, and that temporary rewiring can have lasting effects. So you've been, <coughs> you've been talking about the reduction of stigma around speaking openly about psychedelics. You made a parallel to courageous people who came out during the gay rights movement and their role in reducing stigma there. Um, another parallel I feel we can observe is the importance of personal experience amongst lawmakers. In the gay rights movement, for example, a lot mm -hmm. of traditionally conservative lawmakers would have a, a courageous family member who would come out as gay, and they would be conservative on all social issues except for gay rights, yeah. because they had that personal experience. <coughs> and uh, my question is, is there a way for us to push for sensible drug policy by finding ways for getting people in government and lawmakers to have those personal experiences that will open up their mind about psychedelics short of dosing the US congressional cafeteria? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should start at the top. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so we're back to putting it in the water supply. I don't know why you guys keep coming around to that. Um, I just don't think that that's ethical. Yeah. But thank you for the thought. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, and I guess I, I want to add a friend, Dimitri Mugianis, uh, has a really good thought bubble around this. Um, I, I don't know that giving everyone psychedelics is necessarily the answer. We have seen tremendous um, promise, of course. I know it's not. Yeah, actually. it's. I would say it's definitely <laughs> not um, the right answer. Uh, you know, he, as Dimitri says, if you're a sociopath and you do psychedelics, they'll make you a better sociopath. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> food for thought. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's not automatically sweetness and light. There is the example of Charles Manson, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the fact is these drugs are incredibly suggestible. Um, and, you know, we were told that the CIA experiments in mind control were failures by the CIA. Um, <laughs> you know, so you can, um, you know, could, the, could LSD be used to brainwash someone? It's not out of the question. Uh, you know, I don't think we should just assume that, the, right. that there's an inherent tendency in the direction of peace and love. 
yeah, in these drugs? Because there may not be. Uh, you know, as, as we said earlier, set and setting are everything. And so imagine a bad set and a bad setting. Yeah, uh, they're tools, like, right. like a knife is a tool. That's that can right. be used to like, cook a meal. Or to uh, kill somebody. Exactly. Yeah. And so we have to think about these tools. It applies to any tool, really. Um, and that's, that's, I think, the thing I'm most interested in having these conversations about is not to get around saying, oh, how great psychedelics are, but let's talk about the tremendous potential they have. But let's also be realistic about the real risks that are there. And the way forward, in my opinion, is not to uh, parade around saying it's either either the extremes or he went in the drug war, oh, drugs are bad, don't do drugs, they're terrible, or the opposite extreme, oh yeah, everyone take acid, that'll save the world. But come on, let's be balanced and let's discuss honestly the benefits and the risks. Yeah, no, I, I think so, and each drug on its own terms too, because yes. I mean, they, they all get lumped together and it's a very irrational, if you look at the scheduling of drugs <laughs> that we have under the Controlled Substances <laughs> Act, it doesn't accord with anyone's version well, of reality. I, I would say even the definition of a Schedule One substance is pretty absurd. It's that these have no accepted medical use, yeah. and every single thing on that list, almost pretty much bar none, I'd say, has a medical use. Talking about psychedelics, of course, talking about mar marijuana, even heroin, if you go to the UK, it's given in hospitals. You can look this up. Um, everything on that list has a medical use. Um, but anyway, that's yeah. uh, Okay. Um, have you encountered any sort of experiences where uh, psychedelics have been used to address like short-term memory loss or, or mental acuity that, that's being degraded over time? And if the short answer to that is no, my backup question is could, could you talk a little bit about maybe revisiting this space after having an ego death that went bad or, or maybe Mike, even your paranoia at Burning Man and what the process is like for, for rejoining this, this community? Thank you. The process for reintegrating after a, like a bad trip? Exactly, or even just thinking about this space in, in, in the ex after the experience that you've had. Yeah, there's been some speculation about uh, neurogenesis uh, on um, psychedelics, but you know, from some of the researchers, and, and some are interested in studying whether there might be some value uh, in uh, treating Alzheimer's or preventing Alzheimer's, but it hasn't gotten very far yet. It's, it's, it's kind of a hypothesis. There is a neuroplasticity that seems to happen. Uh, there's some, some mild evidence for that. Um, but bad trips, why don't you take that one? Yeah. Th um, thank you. <laughs> the honest answer is I'm still recovering. Uh, it, I was hit very deeply um, in ways that still affect me to this day. And um, it's a journey. And I'm just trying to find the lessons trying to figure out um, what I can learn from the experience. Um, the biggest gift I've gotten from that experience is to be able to talk honestly about having a bad trip. Uh, uh, so as I do think it's important um, that we have these discussions too. Thank you. And you know, the, the, the construct of the bad trip um, is you know not used by the therapist. They, yeah. they tend to they t and the guides they talk about a challenging difficult trip. experience because if you have a bad trip, so called in the presence of uh, a good guide uh, or therapist, um, it can be incredibly productive yes. because the material that comes up is is good stuff to work on, right? Stuff you need to work on probably and. Um, uh, so they, they, you know, very often bad trips in the long term become yeah. very positive things. Yes, and actually it's a good opportunity to, to talk about, I alluded to earlier the Zendo Project, um, and if you're not familiar with the Zendo Project, it's a subsidiary of MAPS, and they go to Burning Man and other festivals and provide psychedelic harm reduction services for people who are having these difficult experiences. And as you mentioned, like the, the principle of it is this, uh, they have four principles. One is you're sitting and not guiding, as we've talked about before, which yeah. is like very much like with the therapy, um, that you, you create a safe space, uh, that you're talking someone through the experience versus talking them down. So you don't want, and someone's tripping and you're sitting with them, you don't want to say, oh, but you're, it's cool, we're at a festival, everything's all right. You don't want to minimize what they're experiencing, but you want to go right through it. And ideally, you can use this opportunity and if you do it right, a difficult experience is not necessarily a bad one. And it can be a, an opportunity for tremendous transformation. Yeah, and there are, yeah. Well, let's leave it there, because there are a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, Thanks. That actually kind of goes into what I was gonna ask about, is if you want to help people in a way where you want to be able to guide them better through those types of experiences, 
how do you recommend we begin our journey in becoming a psychedelic guide of sorts, or maybe even actually becoming a psychedelic guide? Well, you know, you apprentice, you, I mean, there's two routes. I mean, one is the above ground route, and you go to the, uh, you know, California Institute for Integral Studies has a guide training program um, that is a not most, I mean, it's mostly non-resident uh, thing, and you meet for seven weekends and do an internship, and you get your certificate, and you need some sort of license. You need, uh, as a, that's right. And, um, uh, and then the other way is there are, um, you know, there are underground guides who train, who have, um, you know, apprenticeships. Uh, and that's the other way. I've met people who've gone through that. Um, so there are, there are a couple ways to do it. Cool. Thank you. We can't tell you how to find them, though. <laughs> Hi, thanks for being here today. So I actually haven't had a chance to read your book yet, but I was wondering if you had any knowledge regarding the study of ketamine and uh, ketamine IVs to study or to help heal depression. I actually was not aware of this until a couple of days ago. Um, I have a friend of mine who works at John Hopkins and she was telling me about this use for depression. So I was wondering if you could speak yeah. to that science a little bit and what's being done in that area. Um, thank you. Sure. So ketamine is not exactly a psychedelic. It's actually an anesthetic uh, and it's a dissociative. Um, uh, and it has been used in anesthesia for a long time and it's actually a relatively safe anesthetic. It has less impact on the cardiovascular system. It doesn't depress it as much as other, some other anesthetics do. Um, it was discovered that at lower doses than the one that knocks you out, um, you have an experience that some people describe as a psychedelic experience and a, and a kind of a separation of, of self. Um, and that that has, uh, is being used to treat depression. Um, the drug is approved as an anesthetic and that means that doctors can prescribe it off label uh, for other things legally. And that's happening. There are legal ketamine clinics um, in the city and, and around the country. And there's a lot of excitement in the psych psychiatric community about it. Um, I, don't, I didn't write about it at great length. I really did, I don't write about MDMA that much either. I really, I limited myself to the, to the you know, so-called classic psychedelics in this book because they share a history and they share a neuroscience and it, there was a kind of logic to it. And I didn't want to, you know, it was already 400 pages. Um, <laughs> so, um, but ketamine is very interesting and um, it appears that it doesn't, uh, last, that the, the treatment needs to be administered again. Um, I don't know how often. Um, there's, a, there's a very good article uh, by a very fine journalist named Moises Velasquez Manoff that's in the current or the last issue of Wired. Um, so if you want to learn more about ketamine, that's a good place mm. to start. There's also a ketamine conference coming to the Bay, I believe in November. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so um, I don't know the details of it, but uh, if you Google the ketamine conference in November, like, I think you'll find it. So. Hello, how are you? Hi. Um, just wanted to uh, ask a little, I took you know, a lot of LSD in the 60s, and it was a whole trip, and we did all this, uh, you know, I tripped with uh, Timothy Leary, but um, I wanted to know the difference when you're taking it in therapy. Can you explain a little bit about What's the difference about taking a, you know, yeah. a trip at home and, and going to therapy like for the PTSD? And yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So th the big difference is that you are, um, uh, that you're having more of an internal trip. So in all these trials, and this is also common among underground guides, you wear eye shades, which to many people who have lots of experience tripping outdoors, concerts, seems like a really weird idea. And you're indoors and you're lying down and you're listening to music on headphones, uh, well usually headphones, not always headphones. Um, and both the music is meant to block out the rest of the environment, but it also has a positive function. And the eye shades too are to limit distraction and they basically encourage you to go inside. So you, you have a very different, to the extent that there's a, there's a kind of intra-psychic movie that unrolls, you know, unfurls during the psychedelic trip, that's very much um, created by your external environment if you're walking around and you don't have, and, you're, and your eyes are open. Um, but when your eyes close, you just go somewhere else and your imagination takes over and you, you are more likely 
to say visit your cancer if you're a cancer patient or um, have you know deal with repressed memories things will come up so it's a more you know uh, internalized experience and I think that's really key um, if you you know if you're processing um, psychic material um, because the world is incredibly stimulating on psychedelics as you know and can distract you from internal material so I would say that's to me the key difference am I missing yeah. something here? yeah the, well, th what was the original question the difference between between taking a, yeah t taking it therapeutically versus recreationally yeah definitely the going inward is a huge factor and it's also just the intention behind it yeah is important. that's right I As think that's a good point that you're, one of the things the therapists or guides do is ask you to set an intention. I want to deal with my mortality. I want right. to confront my eating disorder, you know, whatever it is. Um, and it doesn't always take you there, um, but it often does. Yeah. And, um, and that becomes kind of the subtext uh, of the experience. And, and doing it in that intentional way is, a, so if something difficult arises, if you're there with a provider, you know, you can much more easily go through that experience as we were talking right. about before. Whereas if you're a paranoid at Burning Man, you don't really have any many outs because you can't, who do you trust at that point? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so definitely recommend taking psychedelics with somebody you trust. The trust aspect is really, really important. Yeah. Mm. How much more time do we have for it? Okay, cool. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so in the book, you kind of paint this two schools of thought, the Timothy Leary and the Al Hubbard, and Leary is to everyone in the water, which seems to keep coming up here, and Hubbard's like to the elites and the higher-ups and try to go top-down. Yeah. What do you think is the optimal way to bring like a new class of drugs or something to a society or to help it be integrated where that doesn't get banned and that it is properly yeah. sh uh, shaman or properly like brought in? Yeah, well, for people who didn't read the book, I mean, there is a, the, I mean, you, you, you spotted a, I mean, a very deliberate contrast between two key figures, one of whom everybody knows and the other of whom hardly anyone knows. Al Hubbard was a, uh, a very strange man of mystery who was known as the Johnny Appleseed of LSD or Captain Trips in the, in the 50s. And he, unlike Timothy Leary, who he detested, um, believe that the way to, to, to change consciousness, going back to this earlier question, is you turn on the best and the brightest. You turn on the elites in industry, in the church, in technology. And he set about doing that. He, he allegedly turned on about 6,000 people over the course of his 15-year career. Uh, and he went to Silicon Valley and he started the tradition of, of uh, engineers in Silicon Valley using LSD and psilocybin. Um, and he, high officials in the church, Catholic church, he, he turned on. And, um, and his idea was the new consciousness would filter down. Um, Leary was a Democrat, a populist, and he thought, give it to everybody right away, as soon as possible. Um, he was in a great hurry to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was the Mandarin view and the populist view. I, I, I can't tell you what's right. Um, you know, the, the populist view did contribute to the backlash, um, but is that Leary's fault? Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, Leary also created the conditions for this renaissance by turning on so many people who ended up becoming the, you know, regulators at the FDA. You know, there, there are people all through society now that have been turned on because of Timothy Leary. And that's one of the reasons people are not reacting quite as violently to what's going on. They know the territory. They're not terrified by these drugs. Mm. So it, it's an interesting thought experiment, but I don't think it, 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 there's, an, there's an easy answer. There are good arguments on both sides. And, and if I could maybe rephrase your question, are you asking um, how can we responsibly get psychedelics to, to more people? Or, uh, or newly discovered other drugs? Yeah. I mean, I, I guess my go-to answer is education, right? Uh, and let's be, we can get psychedelics to more people. We don't have to just dose the elites. Yeah. Right? Um, we can provide, I think there is a way that we can get access to more people um, and to kind of, let's just do it in a responsible way. Let's, let's actually do real education. And, and I would say in our medical system as it is today, we actually don't do a very good job at giving people informed consent about what they're taking. You go to the doctor, they write you a script, and you might have like a, 
a long legal list of potential side effects, right. but never how often it. do you actually have a real conversation right. with a doctor about the risks of the substance you're taking? So I think in many ways our overall system needs to have, be more responsible, and um, we need to have more open, honest conversations about what we're putting in our bodies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Next question. How's it going? Um, hey. Just uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, I know a ayahuasquera, a curandera, who she got murdered by a Westerner from Canada. She went down and she was like one of the only, she was a very famous curandera, ayahuasquera. And uh, the guy went down there and he ended up murdering her because she, she wouldn't give him continual doses of ayahuasca. I wasn't sure if you guys were aware of that in the community, and uh, I see that as a potential problem. You know, that, that was a woman who had a lot of Icaros and mm -hmm. a lot of information as far as ayahuasca, and coming from a female perspective, which is actually rare down there. Um, what are your thoughts on that, and are you even aware of what had happened? Yeah, just no, I wasn't. I, I hadn't heard the story. It's a horrible story. Um, you know, there have been, been a lot of uh, stories like that. I mean, people, victims of sexual abuse going to Peru, um, curanderas that unlike this person were not um, legit. Uh, and people need to be careful. People need to be really careful. There's a lot at stake. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the problems with prohibition always is that you can't regulate. You can't have standards for the quality of the drug, for the training of the person administering it, all these kind of things. When you have prohibition, ironically, anything goes. And, um, and that's why figuring out a sensible way to incorporate these medicines, if indeed they're proven to be safe and effective through this trial, um, gives us, may give us a much healthier uh, environment than the one that exists now. Yeah, I would agree with that, and I don't have an answer for that particular, um, I was aware of the, the tragedy that happened there, but I don't have an answer for it. But I, I, I would agree with you, echo what you said, that if we can get out of this drug war and decriminalize, um, we can actually, that gives us the ability to create the safer yeah. access points and containers. Yeah. And I think, are we about, two yeah, two questions, okay. Hi, okay, I'll keep Hi. it short. Really excited to be here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really nervous to be asking this question in front of a big group of people, my palms are sweaty. Okay, um, I wanted to throw it back to uh, when you were asked a tough question earlier about um, the criticisms of uh, having a very um, white male um, centric book in a very white male community of uh, the psychedelic, psychedelic community in the United States. Um, you mentioned that you didn't feel that you were a leader, um, and uh, but I, I would say that you've got you know a big group of people that are here, and that you're a newcomer. But you've got a lot of people that are here listening to you, excited to hear you speak, and I would love to hear your thoughts on what the community can do, especially in the United States, to make sure that we're bringing more diverse voices to the table and. Um, giving space to, to more diverse people to hear you know, their experience with the, with the psychedelic community. I didn't work yeah. that well, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think, that's, I think it's really important work, and it's the same work we need to do in every aspect of our, our society. Uh, it isn't just a, a problem in the psychedelic community, obviously. Um, we have a sexist society, and people need to take affirmative steps to bring bring other people, unlike themselves, into the community. Um, I mean, you know, this is a book about science, and, and by the way, science in general is very sexist. We know. We know all the forces that discourage women to go in, and girls from going into science. Um, so that you can't just fix one little piece. Um, you can't just, you could fix the psychedelic community, but you, you, you will not have fixed the society. So you have to, you have to struggle against sexism uh, and racism across the board, and the effects will be felt in the psychedelic society. Um, I do think there are stories that need to be told about important women in the book, you know, uh, in, the, in this world. I, I've, I always felt bad that Mary Cosimona wasn't a bigger, didn't have a bigger role in the book, um, because I had interviewed her and I was so impressed with her work. This is the guide at, at Johns Hopkins, and, and she's quoted in the book, she's there, but not, you know, she, I, I think she's a, 
I think she is a hero in, the, in this research uh, program that deserved more attention than I give her. And, and, and I regret that. And I hope, I hope the next time someone writes a book about that and they're trying to make the book fresh and not like mine, one of the things we'll do is profile Mary Cosimano. Um, uh, so, you know, it's not over. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. Um, in terms of bringing African Americans into the community, I think that's a problem of, of uh, racism, actually. I mean, think about it. This is an experience where to, uh, first takes a very long time. You need leisure time to have a psychedelic experience. You need to have whole days you can give to them. Um, it also is an experience that you shy away from if you don't have a safe environment. And what African American feels safe in their environment? How many? Um, uh, you know, our society has not created the space where an African American can, can feel safe having a psychedelic experience. Um, so that's a bigger problem than psychedelics. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to add a few things to that. Um, you're right, it is something that's not just in the psychedelic community. This is a broader issue, and it's reflected, of course, in the psychedelic community. Um, that said, if there is any community that's going to be able to solve this issue in a way that can create a model for other parts of society to mimic, it should be the one that's really self-reflective and doing these psychedelic experiences. <laughs> so uh, I think we actually have an opportunity in the psychedelic community to do things that ripple out. And I would actually ask for everyone here um, who's involved in these communities to be proactive. And I, I'll speak for myself. I, this platform here, Psychedelic Seminars, I'm going to use it to showcase more, I know today it's two white men on the stage, but uh, <laughs> well, um, I, I, you can hold me to it. This will have uh, more diverse voices. Uh, I've been in talks already with several people uh, about this exact thing and where we'll go next with this. Uh, so I think these are very important topics to discuss. Um, I g another thing I would add, um, well, so there's openings, right? You've created an opening with this book that more people can step into. So the question for me is how do we help people, elevate people to step into this opening? Now there's more space in culture, in culture in general for us to talk about psychedelics thanks to this book. Let's fill that space. Yeah. And um, I'll add one more thing on this topic, which is to say um, a large part of the psychedelic community is taking, you know, for good reason, is saying, hey, okay, we're scientists, we're not advocates of certain policy measures. I would say that if we are looking at changing psychedelic standing of the psychedelics, we are changing drug policy, right? And I would say that if we're going to talk about changing drug policy, we need to have the people most affected by the bad drug policy, the drug war, having a seat at the table for what the new drug laws look like. And I just want to put that thought bubble out there. All right, and last question. Last question. Better be good. I was going to say, a lot of pressure. Um, so you've kind of made a name, both in food and psychedelics, of calling out um, cultural elephants in the room, so to speak. Um, do you have plans for continuing down the journey you're on now with psychedelics, or is there another topic that you think kind of is piking your curiosity to continue and, and travel down? Yeah, well, that's a good question, and I don't have an answer. Um, I, you know, I don't know what my next project is. I'm, uh, this path has been really interesting to me. I don't feel I've learned everything there is to, to, to be known about it. And that what I'm learning, especially about the mind and, and neuroscience, has fascinated me. And, um, and I'm also very interested in non-pharmacological uh, altered states of consciousness um, and uh, meditation. You know, my, my experience with psychedelics really opened up meditation for me, as it has for many people. Um, it's kind of like, you know, psychedelics, you could argue, are the entry drugs for meditation. Um, <laughs> and... Um, which I know is not the drug war formulation, but <laughs> sometimes it works that way. Um, so I don't know where I'm going, um, but I'm very interested in continuing this exploration of the mind and finding other ways to do it. And, um, uh, but for the time being, this is my life. I mean, talking about this and uh, continuing to change minds and um, be out there uh, as someone who is not a leader, but, um, but an hopefully an explainer, a storyteller, um, someone who can, you know, uh, make good use of this opening, invite other people into it. And, you know, I think we're at a very interesting moment. I mean, I think th the response to this book, which has absolutely flabbergasted me, I had no reason to believe, nor did my publisher, that, that um, Americans were ready to buy a book about psychedelics. Um, 
you know, we know how to buy a book about food. You know, we've all done that. Um, but this was, this was a, you know, so it's been a, a real surprise. And, and now that I'm over the surprise, let's look at the opportunity. Well, the opportunity is to have a new kind of conversation about psychedelics and mental health. And, that, and we haven't really talked that much about it, but <laughs> one of the reasons that people are receptive to this conversation is not just the fading of 60s stigmas, but the fact that mental health treatment is broken um, and that we have uh, so many people suffering in this country and so few tools to help them. Uh, only about half the people with serious mental illnesses receive any attention from the system, get any care. Depression rates are rising, suicide rates are rising, addiction rates are rising. There's a real crisis. And the tools, uh, really, there's been no innovation since the early 90s. We have SSRIs, you know, and, um, and some very toxic psychiatric drugs. Um, so that's the really exciting opportunity um, to treat all that suffering, mm. and, um, uh, and, and that's why I think the future is really bright, um, yeah. because, because we need it. Yeah, and I'll add to that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm going to be around a little longer. I'm going to be out signing books out there. Anybody wants to get a book signed? Yeah. And, um, but I want to thank Mike for his role, not only in organizing this event, but in conducting this conversation, uh, and that he is one of the impresarios of that conversation. And uh, so, very grateful to him, and Alan, and Adam. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Michael.